There's two considerations in salvaging material from orbit. One, finding something that's legal salvage. Two, finding something that's valuable enough to bring back. If I wanted to be flippant, I would call this series Matlock in Space! But a series about a junkman who built a spaceship from spare parts and goes to the moon sounds like it could have had all sorts of possibilities. That's first degree salvage. Salvage one. Build a spaceship, go to the moon, salvage all the junk that's up there, bring it back, sell it. Salvage One is a 1979 adventure series shown on the American ABC network. Salvage One kicked off with a two hour premiere that set up the premise for the series that would follow. A series that tried very hard to ignore the premise set up in the movie. Harry Broderick, Jettison Salvage. Harry Broderick had a dream. In the pilot movie, Broderick is the head of Jettison Salvage. He's shown to be adept at wheeling and dealing, selling things before he's even bought them, that sort of thing. After hearing an estimated value of equipment left behind by the moon missions, he decides he's going to build a spaceship out of junk and collect the lunar salvage. So he put together a team. He enlists the help of Skip Carmichael, an ex-astronaut who's also a bit of a daredevil, and Mel Slozar, who's a brilliant fuel specialist working as an explosives technician on movie sets. They build a parts bin special, the Vulture, using whatever they can get their hands on cheaply. I remember the time I tried to build a lawnmower out of a desk fan and a bag of Doritos. It didn't take. I probably should have eaten the Doritos first. It looks like a cement mixer. It used to be. Where are the other stages? There aren't any. You're looking at the whole ship. Vulture is put together with a gas tanker, a cement mixer, surplus engines and magical fuel. In the pilot, Skip and Mel do go to the moon, though they will need some help from authorities to get back safely. The pilot movie is a fun and charming diversion in a way that stepping barefoot on a broken bottle is certainly not. Not careful, Harry. You're going to find yourself on the way to Venus. Shucks, and we forgot to bring the sandwiches. Everything doesn't always go the way of Jettison Salvage. In the first dozen episodes, FBI agent Jack Klinger is on their case. Klinger is not a friend, nor is he an outright enemy. He's a frenemy. He is to be stopped and he is to be told nothing. Absolutely nothing. Do you understand? He's often given the dirty job of having to reluctantly stop Harry's schemes. I'll tell you one thing, Jack. You're paying for that gate. Maybe so, Harry. But right now, you're under arrest. Salvage One the Movie is a fun and quirky intro to a weekly series that followed. A weekly series that pretty much forgets the important part of the show's unique selling point, that is, a junk man with a homemade spaceship. What we got instead was a series of capers where Harry, Skip and Mel are on some money-making scheme, almost exclusively not requiring the use of a spacecraft. When we first meet him, Harry seems to be making money hand over fist, but during the series always seems to be a little short on cash. Harry, how can you be that far behind in your taxes with all the money we've been making? I know it may not look it, but we got a big overhead. Skip is introduced as a daredevil, jumps at a shot to rejoin NASA, and also pursues Mel romantically. We'll get that satellite ourselves. Mel, for her part, seems devoted to making Harry's schemes a reality. The spaceship, when we are graced by its occasional appearance, is known as the Vulture, but registered officially as a hovering device under the name Salvage One, and for some reason appears very sporadically in the show named after it. It's like calling a show Hawaii Five-O and setting two-thirds of the episodes in Iowa. I dig, hiring a crane every time you wanted to show the ship lifting off and landing was expensive. When the ship does make a rare appearance, it's often just as a substitute for a cargo plane or a helicopter. But if it could go into space purely through the magic of reusing already shot footage, then hooray! So if, like Brigadoon, you do manage to time it right and see the Vulture, you can see the bits borrowed from cars, NASA surplus, a remote control that's built from a bread box, the crew wear normal motorbike helmets, that sort of thing. At first, they borrow computer time from NASA. By borrow, it's actually hacking, but whatever. Now, we don't have all the fancy NASA equipment, so we're going to have to wing it. What are you going to do with that? That's for maneuvering. Figure I'll give it a little shot, they'll give me some thrust. The Vulture takes off and lands from Jettison Salvage's junkyard in Los Angeles. Yes, the Vulture takes off from town and can get to the moon using less fuel than a Saturn V rocket, doesn't produce excess G-force and just uses sustained thrust to get to the moon faster than, well, look, the science is sketchier than a charcoal rendering of an Etch-a-Sketch. Mel has invented a new fuel, monohydrazine, and by fuel we mean liquid explosive. 
so in the pilot some of the solutions can be a little convenient, apart from Harry having to leave the trip to the moon to Skip and Mel. If you go for that satellite, we're gonna feed it to you. You must be holding the microphone too close to your mouth. You sound like you're mad or something. So if you manage to find some way of watching the series in full, I'll explain in a bit, you shouldn't expect a science fiction series. It's a quirky adventure series, not action adventure, just adventure, with snappy dialogue delivered by a really solid cast. There aren't car chases or fist fights or shootouts, well not too many, yet at the same time manages to be quite fun and engaging most of the time. Everything above board. Perfectly legitimate business venture. Can't think of anyone who'd want to stop us. I can. Jettison salvage, recover an old warplane from a jungle, disassemble a classic Bugatti in search of a treasure, acquire a robot, build a hot air balloon out of parachutes to escape from some crooks, sell gasoline, and in one episode a haunted mansion is hiding an alien who takes on the shape and homespun personality of Harry Broderick. Some things we handle by the seat of our pants. Richard Jekyll's clinger is taken hostage by a dictator and rescued by Harry and crew. The actual vessel, the Vulture, only pops up in a few of these episodes. You had to bring that up. As a kid, boo, here's more spaceships. As an adult, you know, I quite like this cast and their tomfoolery. Most episodes start off with them chasing greed, but ending the show as caring humans. They don't always win, but we'll love them anyway. What on earth is that? That is how we move an iceberg to California. A two-part story sees Skip accept a commission to go on a space mission, just as Harry and Mel are planning a salvage mission to collect the satellite before it burns up. At the same time, Klinger's bosses want Harry stopped. You have the unmitigated gall to use what I told you against me? Well, I'll tell you one thing, fella. There's no tax lien going to keep me from getting what's legally mine. One long-running theme in the background is an idea to capture an iceberg and tow it back to California to negate a drought. They talk about it from time to time, and then the second season opens with a two-part premiere where the iceberg caper plays out. And yes, the ship appears. Well, bits of it do. I don't want to know how that happened. There's a school of thought about dumping frozen fresh water in a warm saltwater climate isn't necessarily that great for the sea's local ecosystem, but they even bring that up in the show. The average water temperature off the west coast of Santa Lea is about 60 degrees. So the iceberg really shouldn't bother the fish too much. The second season premiere saw Mel feeling listless and wanting to do something more with her life. She meets orphan Michelle, who Mel seems to have inspired. Mel ends up unofficially adopting the girl, who's made a cast regular. Jack Klinger seems to have gone, and supporting character Mac has been promoted to series regular. The Iceberg two-parter Hard Water looked quite expensive for a show like this, where Jettison Salvage attaches one of the ship's rockets to guide a rogue iceberg away from shipping lanes. Well, we saw in San Francisco. So basically, they don't use the ship all that much, and they very rarely go into space. But then in the credits each week, we get this. Who knows what they'll do next? But by now you've realised they aren't going anywhere that rhymes with Schmeish the Schmeinel Schmontia. Half million miles. All the way to the moon and back. Not flat. Salvage One, like most shows, is actually about the people, not the hardware. The charm does start to wear a bit thin once you realise their caper is quite often doomed to failure. Pretty much like my attempt to scale Mount Everest barefoot a second time, or more accurately, bare stumped. Uh, they've been promising, but the results have been limited due to lack of funds. If there's a massive money-making scheme that looks like it will make Harry, Mel and Skip super rich, then about halfway through the episode, disaster will strike and they'll be lucky to get out alive. They drill for oil, which ends in disaster. They mine for diamonds in a Hawaiian volcano, which ends in disaster. That sort of thing. We gotta get out of here fast. And these are disasters mostly caused by Jettison Salvage, a health and safety violation posing as a weekly television series. Issues that only happened because a get-rich-quick scheme turned out to be too good to be sane. Famed science fiction author Isaac Asimov is credited on some episodes as an advisor, which is kinda cute unless he wrote lots of short stories about roughnecks putting out oil fires started by the same roughnecks. That's great! Salvage 1 had rated OK in its first season, but was cancelled just as the second season began, leaving behind four unaired episodes. That does leave us with the equivalent of 20 or so one-hour episodes of a reasonably unique series. 
The show is listed as being created by Mike Lloyd Ross, who is credited with writing several installments, though he only has a few credits on IMDb to his name. If you know more, then please leave a comment. One of the executive producers was Harve Bennett, who'd been responsible for the $6 million man, Bionic Woman, Invisible Man, Powers of Matthew Starr, and the Star Trek films made in the 1980s. With enough of this modified Prime Accord, we can cut any size Berg we want. <laughs> Trish Stewart appeared as a guest star in various shows of the era. Joel Higgins would later star in 80s sitcom Silver Spoons. Now you've gone too far. Andy Griffith, of course, was the star of The Andy Griffith Show in the 60s, as well as appearing in that show's various spin-offs. By this time, he was doing lots of guest shots and starring roles in TV movies. Salvage One was just one series starring Griffith that, well, like the Vulture in most episodes, didn't take off. Then, of course, he became known in the late 80s for starring in Matlock, ruthlessly mocked in The Simpsons as the senior's discount of TV sleuths. So calling Salvage One Matlock in Space isn't entirely appropriate or respectful, so we won't say Matlock in Space again, apart from just then. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, lad, have you got the helm then? I've got the helm then, sir. All right, full speed ahead then, All right, sir. Full speed ahead. I have managed to get this far in life without really watching any series starring this cast outside of Salvage One. But they're all really, really, really good. Andy Griffith especially. So I won't feel too bad about this. Jefferson Salvage. At lock in space. Wow, we were just thinking about you. Very occasionally we'll cover something that's uh, not easy to cover. Salvage One has only had limited releases in a digital format. Only four episodes were ever released on DVD, which purely coincidentally are the four episodes you'll see in this review. Episodes had, at the time of making this video, been posted on a few different YouTube channels, which does allow you to see the whole series if you search. So this is a mini review, if anything. If the show's ever released on a format we can use, we'll be sure to revisit Salvage One in full. When we talk about the vault of almost, it's really just a catch-all title for shows like this. The ones that had a few episodes made, maybe they had an interesting premise or showed potential, but didn't last all that long. Well, I don't like it. But with the IRS and the FBI and the Army on our case, I think I can handle it. Salvage One is one of those shows that I recall very vaguely from my youth that I didn't particularly like, and then I was surprised when it suddenly appeared on Saturday afternoon. It was probably the first time I was aware of a failed primetime series being burned off in an unimportant time slot. No, it's not too late. As an adult, I find myself enjoying this much more. I really would like to see the whole thing. And I think that's the thing. It's clearly aimed at a family audience, but it's not really got much that kids would enjoy, especially if they wanted, you know, science fiction or action. You always were an amateur. Now get up and start taking this seriously. Over 20 or so episodes, the ship appears in about a quarter of the episodes, all in the first season. Because the rest of the time, the crew are trying to find long lost Confederate gold or fix a horse's broken leg or just anything that doesn't involve. That lock in space! Looks great, doesn't it? Keeping yeah. in mind the melting. So Salvage One is an unusual series. I mean, it feels a lot like a show from the late 70s, but it's still unique. It's not a comedy, but it's quirky. It's not got a lot of action in it, but it does have an adventurous feel. I could have done it. Salvage One is a fun show, if you can find it, and if you can get over the fact that the titular spaceship appears about as often as the Tooth Fairy in a retirement home. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. Schmage, the Schmeidel Schmantier. Schmies are the Schmoyages of the Schmarschmip Schmenter Schmeis.